Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Cole, and uh, I would like to welcome you to this extraordinary session on human trafficking here in this stunningly beautiful city of Baku. An industry in its own right, human trafficking is the third most profitable business, illegal business after weapons and drugs trafficking, worth about 30, 32 billion dollars a year. Between 600,000 and 820,000 people are trafficked every year. And the business is growing exponentially. Everybody in this room will know that trafficking in people is a serious crime, uh, as well as being a grave violation of human rights. Despite that, every year thousands of men, women and children fall into the hands of traffickers in their own countries, and across borders. Almost every country in the world is affected, whether it's a country of origin, a country of transit, or a destination for those victims. So today, we're going to be looking at trying to get perhaps some answers. They're not easy to come by. Perhaps some solutions to the sort of problems and questions the business, business, the emphasis on business today, encounters every hour, every day, somewhere in the world because of the trafficking of human beings. The more I hear uh, and see evidence of this, what is a modern form of slavery, the more I realize that the police alone are not equipped to either stop the trade nor find the traffickers. That's not always because of a lack of will on behalf of the police, although I did find at times some evidence of that, but because to beat the traffickers and end the criminal offences and violations of human rights, you need other components of society to help as well, like business, like the corporate sector, because this is business and it is big business. Uh, trafficking is never straightforward. One girl or boy who's been saved is a success. One boy or girl who's said uh, soul is a massive failure by all of us, i.e. by all of society. It is therefore one of the gravest and most complex of our challenges. So, it's time for somebody to make far more important to me to make some introductory remarks. And so I call upon Dr. Alaya Hamad, Executive Vice President of EHTN, End Human Trafficking Now. Dr. Alaya, would you like to say a word? I just want to say two words, actually, of how we started this. It was really in 2004 we started this vision of women, violence, and trafficking. This is how it started. And we had no idea, actually, what was involved, I have to admit. And we were surprised at how many organizations, NGOs, uh, governments are working on this area. One missing link was the involvement of the private sector. They were not involved. They were not part of the, of the whole process. And we said, okay, should we focus only on involving the private sector? They've been so, they're doing so much in the, in, the, in, the, in the countries. Why don't they, we enlist their support so they can join us in trying to eradicate this, this uh, scourge. And little by little, this is what we did. We met in, 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 in Athens, we had the ethical principles, and this is where we decided not to penalize, not to name and shame, but to work with companies to see whether in their supply chains they would have trafficked people. And this is how we want to help the leadership of the private sector to pull it illicit trade out of business. Thank you, Dr. Lair. I think what we'll do is move on to business, um, because that is the focus. And who better to talk about business um, than Dr. Jean 
Bader Schneider, who is the former senior VP ExxonMobil and president of EHTN. Um, Jean, I'll kick you off, if I may, Please. and ask a question. Sort of, um, business hasn't always been involved in trying to stop trafficking. Did business come late to the party? And if so, why? First of all, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm really happy to see all of you here. It's very important because you are the key to the future. You know, NGOs, governments, civil society have been on this issue for over a decade and have made some progress. It's, so it, it's not like nothing has been done. Great connections have been built. But when you think about who can have the most impact, businesses buy. They buy things, they buy services. So we have a very simple request to all businesses and having run, I think, the second largest supply chain in the world for about 20 years, the request is very simple. Clean your supply chain. Now, it's a simple request. It requires a lot of work. But let me just start, uh, I'll make a few short comments on this and then turn it over. There's everything to be gained. I think it's going to, if nothing else motivates you, it's going to enhance your compliance. New legislation is on the horizon. We have the California Transparency Act in the United States. The EU is currently debating legislation that is designed to have companies certify their supply chains going forward. And you know, big businesses, there's nothing wrong with being a good corporate citizen because it's just simply morally right, right? So tell your friends in business, they've got real business reason for doing it, but they're then the good guys too. Can you give us, thank you, can you give us some uh, good examples, uh, perhaps, of business engagement in the fight against trafficking? First of all, before I do that, I want to correct one thing. Stephen talked about a $35 billion business. That number is used by the White House. I was at a couple meetings two weeks ago where they used it. It's used all over. It is wrong. I know it is wrong. We've hired some folks this summer to begin to get at it. That number is based on 2008 ILO data. If you simply extract, extrapolate that and use econometrics, which is just a fancy word to say some modeling going forward, you get to $250 billion. I think it's going to be over a half a trillion dollars. So that takes businesses to have a fair fight when you've got a half a trillion dollars of illegal money floating around for the sale of people. So in terms of what companies have done well, let's take Apple. Everybody knows about the problems Apple's had with regards to the sourcing of the electronics in Asia. They have now engaged in a series of audits, and clearly audits are going to be an important component for businesses. They have used those audits to go in to Southeast Asia to try to clean up their electronics business and remove forced labor from it. Nike, they've taken hits over the years for their Vietnamese factories, their Chinese factories. They have also used audits to go in and clean up their supply chain with great success. Highly motivated at first because of problems, we want corporations motivated now because they want to be good corporate citizens and want the revenues associated with, complete, with clean supply chains. Right? Okay. Um, let's meet some of the young people um, that we've been talking about. They are here today. Kanza and Sandra are both 16 years old. They're teenagers, they study at the International School of Geneva and are members of the Youth Against Human Trafficking Group. And let's give them a round. Hi, uh, I'm Sandra. And I'm Kenza, and we're both 16 years old, and as mentioned before, we're from the International School of Geneva. So we think that it's uh, probably the right time to talk about how we got to know about human trafficking, which was just about, just over two and a half years ago where um, we, we went to an assembly, which was in school, and all of our grade attended the school. And that's what made, that was the first um, thing that made us really motivated to become involved. And after this presentation, it gave us the opportunity to go to Luxor and attend a conference. And um, it was an amazing experience, and it made us even more motivated to do more to help the cause on our return back home. So when we came back to school, we, we created a small group, just about over 20, 20 students, and we get together every week. 
and we discuss ways of raising awareness or raising raising money. And the money that we raise from bake sales, etc., we we donate to charities. For example, Blue Dragon, which is um, a charity for for traffic for victims in uh, the borders of Vietnam. And for example, we did one day uh, called the Sponsored Silence, and all the students in our group, we weren't allowed to talk for 24 hours to, sh to see what it was like not to have a voice. And we got all the students in, uh, in our school to sponsor us as, many, as much money as they want. It could be from 50 cents to 50 francs. And uh, in the end, we all together, we raised over 1,000 uh, Swiss francs. So that was one example of uh, things that we did to raise awareness and also money. Another example was we had uh, different colored ribbons made and we wrote Youth Against Human Trafficking on them. And even though a lot of the students aren't necessarily willing to be as involved as we are, they are really willing to, um, to donate their money and support the cause. So those ribbons sold really well and everyone in school wears them. Uh, so that's a, a really motivating factor. It makes us want to do more. Also, we've been giving presentations to younger kids in other schools all around Geneva, and we've had really, really good feedback, and it's that that makes other uh, children or young teenagers motivated, and then they start their own group in their school, and that's how it grows. Um, also, we, we link human trafficking um, with the arts, so we know that there's one student in our group um, who does IB theater, and she had, to, she had to write a script of a play from scratch, and she decided to do it about human trafficking, and there was many students, not only in our group, but also outside our group on, on school campus that participated in it. And participating in, in that play, they made it, uh, they made, it made them want to get involved as well, so we also gained more members to our group. And after presenting or showing the play, we also got the opportunity to present to the Red Cross in Geneva, which we're going to do in um, the beginning of June. We also have another event coming up uh, where a, two students in our group decided to uh, organize an event which is open to all of Geneva to, well, for, for the youth, so anywhere between 16 and um, I think 21. And it's open to anyone in Geneva where we're trying to raise awareness and um, funds, of course, which we then donate to charities that we think are worthwhile. And so we have that uh, coming up. Having said that, all of these things that we do uh, are very motivating and we, we hope to inspire other, teen other younger teenagers because, it, because it's important to, um, uh, to be involved in this crime. But we think that as youth, there's only so much we can do. Yes, we raise awareness, we raise funds, and it is rewarding to help victims of human trafficking. But at the same time, what we do is we help victims where the, har the harm is already done. And we feel that businesses really have the power to, um, to treat the source of the problem, which is the production, in the end. And by treating the source of the problem, we wouldn't need to, treat, uh, to raise money to help the victims because they're not there. And so to, to, to end this crime, we have to treat the source of the problem, which is um, the production of t-shirts, electronics, whatever it is, and that's what makes a difference, truly. And as, a, as a, um, an example of a um, business that's done a lot of help towards the cause is the body shop. And now, um, the, not only do they have a good reputation, but the customers that buy their products, they know that it's going to a good cause, and it's rewarding for them to buy a product, whereas from another business, if you're buying something that where you not really sure where your money is going or how they treat the, um, the people that work in the factories, you won't feel as sure as buying from, for example, the body shop. And these, these changes might not be visible now, but we're given presentation, we are raising awareness. People are becoming more and more aware from an increasingly young age. I think social media is a huge, is a huge role in, in raising awareness in, for example, this cause. There's two Facebook groups, there's End Human Trafficking Now and there's Youth Against Human Trafficking. And I think there's over 10,000 members already. 30,000. 30, members already. And um, basically on the Youth Against Human Trafficking Facebook page, all over the world, there's new groups that, that form all over the, in all countries. For example, what we are doing in Geneva, and they post what they're doing every day. 
and uh, it, it's a sort of um, motivation for everyone. It keeps us all going, definitely. Yeah. It's a very key area and very key role these two are playing and leading their peers into these roles. So anybody have a question for them? Otherwise, I'll say thank you to Sandra and Kanza. The lady down here. I think it's just to congratulate you and say you are amazing. <laughs> you really are for you to take on this uh, role and to reach out for your sisters out in the world. My daughter went to the International School in Geneva. So just to say, keep it up, continue speaking about it, and you are also motivating other young women out there and other girls out there. Keep on going. Thank, thank you, you so much. So much. Thank you. All right, thank you girls very thank much. You. That's what we had one more question, but uh, if you can, if you have um, any more questions, then please save them for the session because I want to hear now from another panelist. Um, increasingly, the world uh, depends on migrant labor, which is highly vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. And it's difficult to show the images and build the stories uh, of how migrants uh, can be abused by traffickers. Um, our next panelist is a former colleague of mine, uh, a friend and uh, an esteemed colleague. She's a very talented uh, filmmaker. So, um, Anne Reval, director and producer, Moonbill, Moonbeam Films, since you made the documentary series, Working Lives of Businesses and Human Trafficking, can you tell us perhaps what was your most, I suppose, shocking discovery on the one hand, and what were the most positive business practices on the other? Yeah, I was, very, uh, I was very lucky that uh, when I met uh, Dr. Alea, she asked me if I would try and help her make a series uh, on human trafficking. And a bit like a lot of people, I had no idea of the scale of this terrible crime that we were talking about. But as Gina so rightly pointed out, the, the crime of human trafficking is only really just being quantified properly. I think the best, the, the worst examples are the ones where parents have sold their children into slavery. And as a parent, I found this very, very difficult to report because I thought, well, if you're a mother, you can't possibly sell your child. You wouldn't do that. You'd sell, you'd sell everything first. But actually, the truth of it is, there are very, very millions, many millions of people in the world who have nothing left to sell except their kids. And they're forced to put them into bonded labor. They, I'm sure you probably know this, that parents are forced to take out loans and the children are used as collateral and they are then given to factory owners, uh, all sorts of people, and the children are put into to slavery. They have a long career ahead of them because these guys are not going to be able to pay off their parents' loans quickly. So they're in it for life. And I think that's one of the most pernicious things, that people get into these situations and they can't get out. And they get into them for the best reasons. They get into them because they need to earn a living to eat, just like we all do. We need to earn a living. Thank you, Anne. Uh, did you find positive examples of, 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 say, good business practices? Absolutely, yeah. And actually, I was, I was quite surprised. One really interesting group of people are Kuoni, the Swiss travel agent, who have realized, probably ahead of the, of the curve, because this is now going back uh, three years ago, how important it is for consumers to know that when they go on holiday, they're not just feeding somebody's misery. Tourism can reach out to communities, and that's exactly what they do. They train their staff to be aware of child uh, exploitation in hotels. Um, but they go, they go further than that. They help the hotels within communities to reach out to those communities to provide education, training, health care for those people around them. And so they're building. So the hotel is no longer an oasis amidst misery. And more and more, I think, tourists want that. They don't want to be shut away from the country that they're visiting. They want to feel that they're part of it and learning something. Uh, thank you, Anne, very much for that.